morning. Good 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 morning. This is a reading, a reading about how, as men, we can challenge ourselves to find another masculinity. I'm an actor, Carlos Gonzalez Guillo, Carlos. Carlos Satisabal, a friend and colleague from Bogota, was meant to take part in this conference, but he couldn't be here. So he asked me to take his place. I had his words, he gave them to me to translate from Spanish into English. So here I am, to read as an actor his conference. He left it written here in these pages. Carlos told me, listen, Carlos, a conference about new masculinities, I couldn't possibly, I mean, I'm a man after all, he said. One cannot speak of what one does not know, not even through acting. Although, through acting, perhaps, when it comes to art, one doesn't need to know everything. Picasso said, if one knows already what they're going to do, then why do you do it? I agree. In creation, when one knows it all, there is no invention. In art, a person explores what they do not know, the unknown. Through the imagination, through invention, and I'll do that as an actor through this reading with references to the conference in these pages by Carlos Sanzisau. It says, We are going to draw parallels between our training as actors and the silent cultural training we receive as boys to become men. How in theater and in life, our bodies, eyes, voice, and storytelling are molded to assume a role or a character a man or a woman. As an actor, one needs to ask what it is to be a woman and what it is to be a man, what it is to be someone else. As actors, we are tasked with being other people. That's what we do on stage in theater. We are other people. We are men or we are women. A new masculinity, by the way, is capable of inhabiting a body that was not born a male. But best that I speak about theater and through that, the topic, the masculinities. In theater, the first thing is the eyes, to learn to look, to look clearly, precisely. If your eyes are everywhere, it doesn't work. It works, sure, to give nervous, shifty looks. For example, a bad thief, a novice thief. Whereas a professional thief, an experienced thief, takes things as though they're theirs. <laughs> the firm gaze, the furtive gaze, elusive, nervous. We learn them before we become actors. As children, one learns from watching the grown-ups, the adults, as they undress a beautiful woman that walks into the room. <laughs> or the girl that's about to become a woman. <laughs> As children, we learn that look. The look that undresses with the eyes, the eyes of a violator. To achieve that look, we wait, oh so patiently, for women to get dressed. The look of the mirror with a man's voice into which Snow White's evil stepmother asks, magic mirror on the wall, who is the fairest of them all? Snow White. King Oedipus ripped his eyes out because he knew that it's all in the eyes. Maybe he had an extra eye. <laughs> King Oedipus killed his father and had daughters and sons with his own mother. Unknowingly, sure. But the fact is, his children were also his siblings. That's crazy, isn't it? How do you act that character? How do you create that person? It's all in the eyes. 
The lecherous look of the violator, the rapist. We learn it as children. Sure, we learn to undress with our eyes the girls soon to become a woman. <clears throat> these eyes, these looks, they gnaw at dreams. They evaporate our desires and our love. Sometimes when I find myself seeing through those eyes, I want to pounce on them, my eyes, and rip them out so that I can see inside them. To analyze the pupil, that precarious sense of humor, the diminutive veins that carve their way through the whites of the eyes, the unnerving nerves that connect the eyes with desire, with the brain, with blood. The eyes are the soft organs closest to the brain, two centimeters away. The ear is also quite close, but more so the eye. For that same reason, by the way, it's more risky to get a shot in the eye than a shot in the ear. <laughs> But what I want to see is my eyes on the inside and understand what this look that undresses looks like. You know, that look. The macho. The rapist. <clears throat> From that first gesture that violently undresses, intimidates, and violates with a stare, it's a slippery slope for that macho into verbal aggression, insults, humiliation, and physical violence, beating, to threaten injury, pain, death, weapons, and to confront whomever eyes his conquests, the sexual properties of the violent, whomever seems to desire, with those lascivious eyes, the women that the macho thinks of as his, his property, his woman, this bitch. What the fuck you looking at, man? Huh? You like what you see? Punk? What is this? Take it. Take it. Take it so that you know to respect another man's property. And you? What's with that dress? Huh? Showing off your put her fucking sweater on. thing that needs to go, in terms of how we're trained as children to be a man, to find a new masculinity. Those eyes have to be ripped out, those eyes with the look of a rapist. Like I said before, the gaze is one of the basics of acting, to attempt to become one who one is not, to pretend that I am not me but someone else. There is a sharp switch inside, and I am Sharif, Mez, B. Claudio Perseguido. I see through my eyes, but with a different look, different from how I usually look. I see the world through that character. Because in theater, I lend my eyes and my body to give life to that character. Porque cuando yo veo las correas de las parejas, es como si viera sombras, elementos de un látigo que me azotan directamente de la manera más sutil y más horrible. That's from a letter that a Julio Cortázar character writes to a young lady in Paris. He's describing Thursday, day one, the move into her flat that he's sitting while she's out of town, and how when he sees luggage straps, he sees shadows, elements of a whip that flog him indirectly in the most subtle and horrible manner. And that's how his particular eyes see, and therefore his very particular body react to living in his world full of shadows. I'd like to reiterate, the way we see and look is essential in acting, but also in the new masculinities. To become a new man, we must tear the violence out from our own eyes. The body, I just, 
another essential study in theater. How does the body walk? How does the body move? How does the body sit? How does the body relish and desire? How does the body orgasm? How does the body give birth? The body and the positions of the body are cultural designs. How to sit, how to stand, how to relate to nature, how to walk, how to relate to others, how to enjoy, how to give birth. These are cultural designs. How does the body nourish and give life to another body? The body is designed by our culture. The body being a key question for an actor, a modern man should also, should also ask himself the question in the interest of an alternative masculinity, the man with another gaze, another body. I ask myself as an actor, as a profession, how do I become another man? How does that man look and see? How does he move? Does he move? And what does all this mean? But we rarely ask ourselves this question as a personal question, as a man. How does Carlos look? How do I, this Carlos, look and see and move? That is to say, can I see as a modern man, as a new man, myself as someone else? Not me with the eyes of an intruder that were designed in my childhood, but rather with different eyes, me, other. It's only now that this conference has asked me the question that I asked myself. In a study at the University of Columbia, they asked approximately 1,000 men, what does it mean to you to be a man? And the majority answered immediately with a very simple gesture. It's true. <laughs> the voice is another aspect that we study in theater. We invent exercises to discover the voices within our own voice. For example, the voice of an animal, a dog, <laughs> a cat, yeah. a sheep, bah. the breath of an asthmatic. The sound of a dog baying the moon. <laughs> or to speak in an invented language, one that simulates the musicality of an existing tongue because we appropriate it based on what we know of that culture. Chinese or, da or Japanese. And do to it to do it as a Chinese soldier or a Japanese samurai. The myth. There is a myth which our corporal culture is founded. It's the book of Genesis. Adam, the believer, and Eve, the disobedient. <laughs> this myth contains the deep roots of our corporal design, of a painful birth, of slave labor, of love as control and deluding of Mother Nature. To the woman, he said, I will make your pains in childbearing very severe. 
With painful labor, you will give birth to children. Your desire will be for your husband, and he will rule over you. That's what God said to Eve. <laughs> Genesis 3.16. <laughs> he converts the gift and pleasure of giving life and the desires of love into curses that she must slave over. These curses are the mythical curses through which our patriarchal culture, through which our patriarchal cult culture, excuse me, thrives. In them are written the tragedies and penances of our civilization. The penance of not understanding the languages of nature. The penance of not understanding the languages of other human beings. This is key because one, as an actor, knows that it's all in the songs and the tone of the voice. I will make your pains in childbearing very severe. However, there are cultures in which childbearing is not severely painful. There are studies, in fact, that in a childbirth that is not so severely painful, a deep orgasm can actually occur, the uterine orgasm, the profound orgasm. The sexuality of the female body is very different from the sexuality of the male body. As men, we don't know what it is to have an orgasm immediately after another how to achieve a cascading orgasm, ceaseless, multiple, unstoppable, an unimaginable pleasure for men. But there are many women who orgasm this way, almost endlessly. And they give birth with pleasure, with a uterine pleasure, orgasm. As a man, this needs to be known, and above all, understood. The female body is multi-orgasmic. It is this that provokes hatred towards women. We've researched this topic that I'm talking about in feminist literature and through personal experience. I recommend Pariremos con Placer, We Will Birth with Pleasure, by Casilda Rodriguez. She has a website. Many websites promote her work and speak at great and clear length about this topic. The penance of women to give birth through severe pain is a central manifestation of hatred towards women, of the fear of the multi-orgasmic female body, the fear of their uterine potential, of the complexity and depth of their pleasure. To control and oppress the female body, the monotheological patriarchal myth, I will make your childbearing pains very severe. <coughs> the patriarchal culture has also imposed some normal positions of the body, the way we walk, the way we sit. Many indigenous cultures don't sit the way we do in our culture, and these seats so high up from the ground that make us sit up straight. They have tiny little, they have tiny little seats that make the knees go above, well above the hips, like this. A woman in this position would have a relaxed uterus. Her hips would be much stronger and broader, and her spine would be straight and relaxed at the same time. But here, in our culture, women are taught as young girls to sit with their legs closed, squeeze tight. Sit properly, young lady, they'll get the wrong idea. <laughs> says the matriarch to the young girl playing on the floor with her cousins. Here, if a woman squats or sits with her legs open, her womb relaxed, she would be called provocative, indecent. But if a man sits this way, it's normal. It's macho. Women are forced to sit with their legs closed and their abdomen tense so that her uterus will tense up and cramp to avoid deep profound orgasms. We are also taught not to breathe with our entire body. We unlearn the way we breathe from the uterus, how we breathed as babies. As adults, we learn to only breathe the top part of our lungs, keeping the tension in the lower body. Also, we must, 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 must have a flat stomach. <laughs> to be beautiful women and men, to be desirable, an abdomen that is not flat and tight is undesirable. Were my friend here to say this, he could illustrate it a little more. <laughs> For me, this has been an integral discovery. 
Primarily because I am an actor and in theater I work with women who are also actors. In theater, men and women train and stretch to relax the body, to broaden our midsection, our stance, our different depths of breath. In theater, excuse me, secondly, because I've had to play a woman on stage before. Once I played Clytemnestra in Agamemnon. In playing a woman, being a man, the biggest challenge is the physicality. The physicality that informs the character. Sir, imagine if you had to play a woman, a feminine character. Feminine, but not a caricature or a parody, but rather a very real person, a real woman. You, one, a woman. It's very difficult. In one of the traditional forms of Japanese acting styles, that is the most challenging part for an actor and requires the most training to be a woman an onagata, the actor that plays a woman. Onagatas play the women because in Japanese theater, women cannot act, just like in ancient Greece. Clytemnestra was played by a man then too, but for very different reasons than when I did. Antigone, Medea, Cassandra, all of them played by male actors, always. In ancient Greece, women weren't even allowed into the theater to watch the women being played by men. They just needed to be beautiful silent, obedient. The depreciation of women is also something that we learn and witness from our childhood, from our childhood in our children's books. Stories that later become architects for stories that we see in the theater, on television, and in movies. We mentioned before the magic mirror and Snow White. Now, let's take a look at Little Red Riding Hood's journey. Take this cake and honey to your grandmother, and don't talk to anyone on the way. But, of course, in the first crossroads for Little Red Riding Hood, she finds the big bad wolf, and just like Eve, the disobedient, Red Riding Hood disobeys. And the big bad wolf tricks her. Oh, this is the long way you're on. I'll teach you a shortcut. <laughs> the wolf goes ahead and eats the grandmother. It's strange that the grandmother doesn't recognize her own granddaughter's voice. But, we can suppose that the Big Bad Wolf is a fine actor, because later he tricks Red Riding Hood again. What big eyes you have. So I can see you better. What a big mouth and teeth you have. All the more to eat you better. And he eats her. Now, we need the woodsman to show up. The strong man equipped with his axe. His weapon. So he can open the big bad wolf's gut that digestively naps on his dinner of the grandmother and granddaughter together, and he needs to save them. Like Prince Charming and Snow White, and Cinderella, and Sleeping Beauty too. All the good little girls in these stories, the princesses and the poorly treated, need a man to protect them, to save them. The good girls of the world can be tricked by whatever wolf or witch can deceive them. They are gullible, they are naive. That's what these stories teach them and us as children. Quite the opposite of what is said about boys. David defeats Goliath, saves the town, and becomes a hero. These cultural patrimonies of the beautiful, naive girl for whom we prepare, our masculine voice and eyes must be denounced, abolished. The theater that we create aims to undress these structures of power and violence. It aims to unveil the misery within that structure. For example, exposing ourselves to the misogyny and violence, articulating their hatred and madness. In Pasarela, a collective creation about violence against women directed by Patricia Anissa, there is a character, a macho character, and it goes like this. She'll be back. She knows. She knows. She deserved it. She asked for it. She likes it. She'll be back. Wait and see. She'll be back. Amacho, as a character, articulating his own structure of misery. I would like to think that this character and I have nothing in common. Certainly not that imposing fist, threatening and oppressing with a violence. 
No. But what about what's behind his words and gestures? My partner, of course, has nothing to do with the woman that this character is talking about. She's an actor as well, and together we take care of a beautiful baby girl, Seba. This is her photo. Take a look. Pass it around. <laughs> By the way, she's very beautiful. <laughs> when she was born, my friend, Carlos Apizabal, the one who was meant to speak at this conference and whose place I'm taking, suggested that lovely name, Seba. It means jungle in Spanish. And he recited to my partner, Sevita's mom, a few lines from Dante. Questa selva selvaggia e aspra e forte che nel pensiero rimuova la paura. We named her Selva. The name of nature, of wilderness. Well, with that, I'm nearing the end. We got another one. I make it better. <laughs> the coffee, that is. <laughs> I also change Sylvia's diapers. Becoming a father has shown me different dimensions of being a man, to enjoy a different masculinity. I learned to enjoy the pleasure of changing my daughter's diapers, of playing with her, of bathing her, of loving her, taking her on walks, daydreaming about the way the day that she takes her first steps, talking to her, wondering what those first words of hers would be, of giving Nicola, her mother, my partner, time for herself, of sharing with her the joy of educating and nourishing our child, and being with her, with Celita. Hi, sorry. Sorry to interrupt. Hey. Did I go with my friends? It's time. It's time up. <laughs> Great coffee. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> I'm good, yeah, Sorry. <laughs> Being with Nicola has shown me a way to transform my body into one that can take care of and nourish a little girl. Ha, ha, ha. 
revealing to me one of the most unique perspectives of the question of what it means to be a man, a modern man. Taking care of Servita is a unique pleasure. Becoming a father has transformed me. It's a pleasure I wouldn't know how to describe in words, just as you see. <laughs> just like this, with my baby. Right, Mamo? This pleasure is undoubtedly part of the new masculinities. I learned to be a different father, a father that enjoys taking care of his daughter. It's going to be nap time soon, so we should probably wrap up. <laughs>